one of the things that, of course, I was dreading as I began this project as uh, for the radio show and then thenceforward for the book was I realized there were some real stinkers of letters coming up at the end of the alphabet. I boldly plunged in with A, B, and C and so on, thinking, well, I'll worry about that when I get there. And uh, of course, I, I was worried about X and Z, particularly. Um, you know, Y is not a problem. There's plenty of Y material. But so I worried about X, and there are no Beatles songs that begin with the letter X. You will not be surprised to know. Uh, and what I did, I, I found a couple of workarounds, and this typifies what I did when I had to. In one case, it was my idea, um, which was a very easy cheat, which is in the letter X, I started to talk about X Beatles. And of course, that includes all of them, <laughs> because in fact, they all eventually left the band and became X Beatles. So I could not only talk about Pete Best and you know the X Beatles from the early days, but I could in fact talk about pretty much anything I wanted to under, under guise of them all being ex Beatles, which is what I did. And I also did get one suggestion from a listener, which I used um, because we English are, are, are very keen on, on terrible puns. And the listener pointed out to me that the Beatles had in fact written one song specifically from the point of view of an X-ray technician or a radiologist. Now who knows what song that was. Ooh, I bet, I bet, I bet Radio Dave knows, knows it. You somebody, wanna... somebody must get, think terrible English puns. What's uh, from the point of view of a radiologist? Radio Dave, anything? You got me stumped. You got me stumped. Okay. Okay. The answer, of course, is I'm looking through you. Oh, of course. Of course. Of course. I told you, think bad puns and you can't go wrong. Um, and then, of course, I had to contend with, with Z. And in that case, I had two notions. One was particularly obvious, which is that I started to talk about zebra crossings. And of course, about the most famous zebra crossing in the world, the one that crosses Abbey Road. I then proceeded in the book to give precise directions of how to get to that zebra crossing from the tube station, St. John's Wood Tube, which should you be on your way to Abbey Road is the nearest one. And you walk for about five minutes and you cross the zebra crossing. The zebra crossing, of course, always, except now, is incredibly crowded with people. Taxis actually avoid that route of down Abbey Road because the law is, of course, you have to stop if someone's waiting to cross. And there is always someone waiting to cross at that crossing with a friend taking pictures and they cross very slowly and deliberately. So the traffic is a nightmare um, at that particular zebra crossing. And of course, talking about that crossing takes us into Abbey Road Studios and again, actually allowed me to speak about any Beatles song I wanted to, since that's where they recorded all of them. I also talked about the history of zebra crossings. I talked about the man who invented the zebra crossing. His name was Lord Hoare Belisha, and so on. I tend to digress quite a lot, as you will tell in this little speech and, and in the book and the radio show. But I talked about the history of the zebra crossing and uh, Lord Hoare Belisha was the man who founded them, which is why the beacons that black and white poles with yellow blobs on top that light up are called Belisha beacons after their inventor. Fantastic. More than you ever thought you would learn from a book about the Beatles. Well, great. Oh, 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 oh. What? Go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I talked about uh, when I got to Z, um, I also invented a Beatles zoo. Um, and uh, let me explain that. I'll read a bit of the book here about the Beatles zoo. Because um, there's only actually two Beatles songs that begin with Z, and I only talked about one of them. I forgot all about the other. Um, but then, so I said, so we're going to have to discover other interesting Z topics. I thought we could consider Beatles songs from a zoological standpoint. This Beatles zoo would contain all the animals about which they have ever sung or thought or written. You may think there are not that many of those, but on the White Album alone, I spotted birds, tigers, elephants, bees, and pigs. Not to mention a lizard, a dog, an eagle, a worm, and a monkey, along, of course, with a notable raccoon, enough to fill a sizable menagerie. As we walk into the zoo, first you see the huge building on the right, which is the entomology department, the study of insects. 
in this case, specializing, need I say, in the study of beetles. And as you Buddy Holly fans will of course know, a similar department for the study of crickets. I don't know if you all know that Buddy Holly's band, The Crickets, was the reason the Beatles explored insect names at all. They never would have imagined bad names, band names of an entomological nature had they not been big fans of the crickets. And that's why they ended up choosing the Beatles. Anyway, uh, anyway, we walk past that important building because the Beatles have studied themselves a lot and everyone else has studied them even more. We walk into the zoo itself. This being an imaginary zoo, every animal has the perfect habitat. There are no bars or cages. It is a luxury zoo and all the animals are very happy. For example, immediately in front of us, we, we see this huge, amazing aviary. What birds are in the aviary, you may ask? Well, think about it. We know for sure there is a blackbird and a bluebird as well. Also a bird that can sing and a bird that is spectacularly free. Beyond the aviary, of course, there are many other animals. Some of them you'll know about, some of them you may not immediately think of. There are quite a few dogs, some dogs that have a name. Anyone know the dog that has a name in a Beatles song? No? Martha, my dear, is written oh. about Paul's old English sheepdog. Martha is a dog, not a, not a woman. Um, she was indeed a silly girl. She was a charming dog. I, I knew her well. Um, some, some particular dogs, one dog of a specific breed. Any, anyone guess that? They're not doing terribly well. The dog with a specific breed is, of course, a bulldog. A bulldog. Um, there are also, by the way, cats and a kitten. There is also, of course, a horse with a name. Henry the horse, who dances the waltz, you will recall. There are also cows, and this one is hard. There is only one cow's reference in a Beatles song. It's in the John Lennon song, uh, When I Come Home. He says, I will love you till the cows come home. I also, by the way, looked that phrase up this is another digression, and did discover, interestingly, that this expression, when the cows come home, meaning a long way away, is, has been around since the 15th century. The only change is that in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, it was when the cow comes home. Because, of course, back in those days, the family had a cow, and it was before organized farming came in, when the people had lots of cows. So I found that interesting, but that's the kind of way I get easily distracted when I was writing the book. Um, there are also cows. There is also, of course, a very large and mysterious walrus. That one is too easy. No prizes for that one. Anyway, you get the picture. So I took the letter and invented an entire zoo and found a surprising number of animals in the zoo. So that's a, that's a little excerpt. That's one of the more eccentric excerpts from the book. Take it away, Curtis. Wonderful, thank you. Ask me something or we can uh, open yeah. it up or whatever you think. I think it would be interesting if we just um, kind of um, heard how you got became connected to the Beatles. You were in a group, I think we'd like to hear about this uh, wonderful, okay. duo, the duo that you were in. And I think the Beatles mm -hmm. might've had a spare song that they weren't gonna use. Yeah, okay. So uh, I met the Beatles through my sister. Um, my sister Jane was and is, uh, very successful actress in, in England. We actually all started acting when we were young. I was a child actor as well. Um, my very first film, I had the, had the great honor of having my mother played by a genuine American film star because my mother in the first film I ever did when I was eight was played by Claudette Colbert. It was gorgeous. So I got to kiss Claudette Colbert at um, the age of eight. And uh, anyway, we, Jane and I both started acting. Um, she took to it very well. She quit school at 15, became a full-time actress, became very successful and became a movie star in England. Then, and, and she was in some of those classic 60s films back then, like Alfie and so on, she was in and all of that, playing opposite Michael Caine. And uh, it was in that capacity as a sort of celebrity that she was invited um, by a magazine to go and see the band that everyone was making a, a fuss over and uh, uh, see what she thought. 
she gladly accepted the assignment because she was curious to see them herself. This was the very beginning. Her first single, Love Me Do, was out. And Beatlemania was taking hold of Britain's womanhood. And, and they were all screaming. And, and uh, you know, they were becoming, uh, Beatlemania was, was taking over. And so she was invited to go to their first London concert. She went to the show, thought it was brilliant, and was taken backstage um, at the end of the show as the visiting celebrity to meet the band. Uh, she liked them very much. She found them charming and witty and all the things we know them to be. They liked her very much. Uh, one of them liked her in particular and asked her out. So that's how she ended up going out with Paul McCartney for quite a number of years. And that meant that he was hanging around our family home in London a great deal. He was over for meals and just generally sort of there. And uh, eventually our parents uh, took pity on him in a way and, and offered him the guest room on the top floor of our house. Uh, a sort of a pied a terre when the Beatles were not on the road. And and he moved in and the guest room was on the uh, top floor next to my bedroom. So, uh, and he stayed with us for about two years. So that's Paul and I ended up sharing the top floor of the house, uh, me in my room, him in the guest room. And during that time, I heard various songs, of course. Now, while this was all going on, I had met a man called Gordon Waller at school. We were at school together. Westminster, a serious old English public school. And uh, we'd noticed we both had guitars and stuff and started talking and um, started singing together. We enjoyed singing together. We formed a duo. We started singing at school functions and parties and blah, 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 and eventually ended up getting some paid gigs. We were doing coffee shops and pubs and anywhere we could play. And at one of those, we, uh, we got, um, signed. We, we got spotted by a talent scout from EMI Records who offered us a record contract. We were playing at a place called the Pickwick Club and he, he told us he would like the way we sounded and gave us a record deal. Now, one of the songs I'd, I'd heard, heard Paul playing <clears throat> uh, in the next door room was this song called World Without Love and I told him I liked it and he had explained that uh, it was actually sort of a reject, a leftover kind of orphan because John Lennon didn't like it. He didn't think it was right for the Beatles. He thought the opening line, please lock me away, was kind of silly. And, and he would actually stop Paul after that and go, okay, I will lock you away, the song's over. And so, uh, but I told Paul I liked it. Now, so we got signed to a record deal. Our producer said, I've picked some songs from your show that you do already that I want you to record. He was imagining us at that point, I think being sort of, part of the folk boom, you know, Britain's answer to the Kingston Trio or Peter, Paul and Mary, as it were. And, uh, but he also said, look, <clears throat> if you know any other good songs that you'd like to record, um, you know, bring them along too, to your first session. He booked us one day in the studio with some great musicians about three weeks into the future. So at that point, I went back to Paul that night at home and said, whatever happened with that world without love song? which by the way, he'd also never finished. And uh, he said, oh, you know, I haven't done anything with it. Um, you know, we haven't finished it. John doesn't like it. We're not recording it. It's a reject. And I said, well, I like it. Can, can we have a go at it? Because we've got a record deal now, we, you know. And he said, fine. So he gave us the song. He, he made me, a, a, wrote out the lyrics and the uh, chords for me which you'd better believe is a piece of paper I have safely locked away in a fireproof safe. So the minute the music business goes completely to shit, I can run to Sotheby's as fast as my legs can carry me. But that's another digression. Um, so anyway, uh, I said to Paul, can we work out a version of the song? Uh, and he said, yes, you can. So we learned it, we worked it up. I did have to persuade Paul to finish it. because all he'd written with the two verses. And so as our session grew near, I did have to uh, say, you know, please, you know, that's, this is not enough for a record. We need a bridge. And eventually he uh, uh, grabbed his guitar and went into his bedroom for an infuriatingly short, like eight minutes or so, literally, and came out, you know, with, so I wait and in a while I will hear my, I will see my true love smile. So it's a great bridge that he wrote. And we, we added that in and recorded the song. And, at the end of our session, uh, we'd done about five songs, 
there was no doubt in anyone's mind that that uh, that was going to be our first single, and it was. It came out a month later, or number one first in England, and number one all over Europe, and finally, to our incredulity and delight, number one in America. It changed my life forever. Before that, I'd been, you know, uh, by that time I'd left school. I was at university. I was reading philosophy at King's College London, and uh, but I left. So I am, I am, I suppose, officially, by the way, I'm on a one year leave of absence because in England, they don't give you time off. We don't have those mysterious credits like you have in America. You're supposed to start, get your degree and leave. So when I explained to my tutor, as we call them, the advisor kind of at university, what had happened, that we had this number one record. Um, he finally agreed with me that, you know, this was obviously an opportunity not to be missed. And he gave me a one year's leave of absence to go and explore this pop nonsense. But tragically, I'm still on that one year leave of absence. He's, they're still wait, awaiting my return, I have no doubt. But, but uh, I mean, so at one moment, I was, let's say, on a winter afternoon, I would be driving my, riding my bicycle home from university in London to, to uh, my home, where I was still living. You know, by that in England at that point in the year, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. It's dark and pouring with rain, and you're on your bike driving home. And a year later, I was in a rent, rented Mustang convertible, driving down Sunset Boulevard, being recognized by beautiful women. And I kind of went, "This is better." You know, this is an improvement. And and so that was that. And I've I haven't read any uh, any, you know, my my philosophy studies have. have <laughs> So, so that's, that's how I met Gordon and that's how I made the record. Should we, sh would you like me to call on someone? Sure, by all means. All right. Yes, you can, you can see who's raising their hands. I'm gonna Kathy, scroll Kathy through. Hurley is nodding vigorously. But I don't know um, you know what, She's David, can, David, can you nod if you have a question? Radio Dave, do you have one? Can you, uh, you. Radio uh, Dave, can you, do you have one? I have a question, yes I do. Did you? apply or what did you apply from your Beatles experience and your Peter and Gordon experience to Linda Ronstadt, James Taylor and others? Well, um, it's interesting because there are two completely different um, answers really to that question. Because in each of the cases you mentioned, I filled two entirely separate roles, you know, as because in both cases I produced their records and there was their manager. And it's, it's not customary for one person to do both. And, and um, indeed it was, it was queried at the time. And I will explain, first of all, producing records was an ambition. Uh, the minute I was in the studio, I loved it. I loved the fact, you know, you could hire brilliant musicians much better than yourself and tell them what to do. I thought that was genius. And, and I loved the technology of it. I loved the arranging aspect of it. You know, I, I consciously said, I want to be a record producer. And, and made a plan to become one. Uh, and I had done some there for some record producing, and that's really how I got the job as head of A&R at Apple. Paul McCartney offered me that job, having being already aware of not only me, because we spent so much time together, but of, of some records I'd produced. Indeed, the very first record I ever produced, actually, Paul played on for me. And so, which is intimidating, but, but, but cool. He played drums, which he does brilliantly. And, uh, so that was that. Then, when I met James Taylor, which was a whole other story, and uh, we, I signed him to Apple, we made one record for Apple, and then the Be Apple's at the company and the Beatles themselves were kind of falling apart as a band and as a company. So James and I decided to leave Apple, also a long story. At that point, I, I, James and I talked, we decided to leave, he wanted to go back to America, where he was from, of course, and I decided to move to America and bet my career on his, and we agreed that I would become his manager. So that was never, before that, an ambition of mine. It was just that we didn't know who else we trusted to do it. And I'd watched Brian Epstein, who never managed anybody before the Beatles, and realized that actually a degree of intelligence, of common sense, the ability to plan, and, a, and an intense belief in the, in the artist was, were the key ingredients. They were in Brian's case and they were in my case. I mean, he was the one walking around um, saying, you know, the Beatles were bigger than Elvis and having everyone laugh at him. And, and I got to know Brian a bit and admired him and loved him very much. So, so anyway, that's when I became a manager. Now, so 
as a manager, yes, a lot of what I had learned from Peter and Gordon days was applicable. In particular, you know, there were mistakes I thought our manager, Peter and Gordon's manager, made, uh, which I was determined to avoid. But also, just in general, I think having been on the receiving end of management, one one learned what was infuriating. You know, what really was annoyed you about management. Um, and what could, could be done better and, and so on. So yes, I think having been an artist and have, having had some success as an artist for a few years gave me an insight into what artists found most disconcerting about managers and most valuable about managers. And it gave me some credibility with artists. When I talked about being on the road or something, I wasn't only talking about it from the perspective of a manager leaning back on his de at his desk with a cigar, I was talking about it from the perspective of someone who'd been on the bus, stayed in those crappy hotels, played the gig where you'd been told it was sold out and there was no one there, and all that stuff. So I think that uh, that's pretty much. Um, any any does that answer the question? Well, that's, that's beyond answering. But <laughs> it made me smile throughout. Thank you. Oh, good. Okay. So can you, uh, Peter, what, when you're, uh, you, you mentioned Apple and uh, yes. transition, the Beatles were sort mm -hmm. of uh, petering out and then they launched this entity where they were receiving material from all, from different people. And you were, um, explain to us what an A&R person or an A&R man does. Yeah, it's, a, it's an old fashioned expression. It's, it's artists and repertoire. It's, it means you're overall responsible in the general sense for everyone who gets signed to the label and what kind of records they make, who produces them, what songs they do. Now all those responsibilities get delegated in particular cases, you know, um, because a lot of the artists we signed, I mean, James was somebody I signed myself to Apple with the intention of producing him myself, which I did. Paul McCartney spotted this girl, Mary Hopkin, you might remember, um, had that huge hit with Those Were The Days, and he produced that record for her. Indeed, that song was totally his idea. He remembered it from hearing it in the nightclub six months earlier. Quite extraordinary. And had the whole Mary arrangement in his head. I helped him do it, but, but he was 100% the producer. And uh, um, so, so we, yeah, and then we signed this band, The Ivies, for example, that Mal Evans, the Beatles road manager, found. We signed, and they, in the end, changed their name to Badfinger and enjoyed tremendous success. So. Uh, yeah, all that fell within the purview of a and r and I would have weekly a and r meetings with as many Beatles as were around to talk about who we were signing and what kind of records they would make and so on. I am going to see if there's any other hands that are raised. Um, Brian, do you see any hands raised? If Just uh, a quick piece of information for those who don't know they can raise their hands. If you click on the participants button mm -hmm. on the bottom of the Zoom, you have the option to raise your hand and that can show that you'd like to ask uh, one of these fine in, uh, gentlemen a question. So please make sure if you would like to oh, ask I a see. that you I go that and yeah. click that participants button and click raise your hand so that we can make sure we get your question answered. Thanks, Josh. Do you see any? I see raise hand now. I don't think people knew how to do it. I'm not sure I did, but now I do. I do have a question though, Peter. Thank you so much for doing this and coming on. And Curtis and I have talked yesterday and, and Radio Dave, and we've been so excited to host you and have you here. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, just, I absolutely love the Beatles, but what was your favorite song? Um, it's hard to say, isn't it? I mean, I, think I know favorite, it is. I, I, I tend to, the two things I usually avoid are favorites, you know, lists, you know, people go, what's your top 10? And, and then the other question everyone asks is all the what ifs. What if John hadn't died when he did it? What if this has happened? Or what if, you know, um, uh, I, you know, and the answer is we don't know. As far as favorite songs, they really do change. I mean, every now and then we'll hear a Beatles song um, uh, and you kind of go, oh, I forgot about that one. You know, it's brilliant. I mean, rain is a favorite. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, one of the ones that have, uh, paperback writer is brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm picking the ones that aren't necessarily the most obvious favorite ones, um, but I think it's spectacular examples of songwriting and record making in so many respects. And one of the things I do in the book is try to 
actually analyze what makes those songs so special and what makes the record so special as works of art by the record production team of George Martin and the Beatles. And let's not forget George Martin. Um, I mean, a song that, that resonates with me particularly, as you may know, is, you know, one because of the circumstances under which I heard it first, which is, you know, um, when Paul moved in uh, to our house, my mother was a, a, a classical musician. She was a professor at the Royal Academy of Music. And she originally used to give uh, occasional private oboe lessons at home, but increasingly less so because she was very busy at the academy. And there was a small music room she had used to use in the basement of our house, which had in it just a tiny upright piano, a two person sofa and a music stand, that was all. And when Paul moved in, my mom had explained to him that if he needed a piano, he could use the one in the basement, that that music room was generally speaking empty. He could use it whenever he wanted to. And he did. And as you know, he's a very good pianist as well. And I do remember one day in particular that uh, John Lennon came over and the two of them went down to this basement room and they were down there for a couple of hours. This was quite early, shortly after Paul had moved in. And uh, after a couple of hours, Paul called upstairs to me, I was in my bedroom. I think I was the only one in the house as I recall. And I came down and I sat on the little sofa and they sat interestingly side by side on the piano bench. No guitars were in there. The guitars were upstairs in Paul's bedroom and my bedroom. And they sat side by side on the piano bench and both played the piano, hammering out the song. And they played me the song they had just finished, which was I Want to Hold Your Hand for the very first time to anyone anywhere. So that, and you, you either asked me what I thought. You know, so that song, um, I wouldn't, don't know if it's necessarily my favorite Beatles song, but it's certainly one of my most memorable ones in the sense that I heard it under those remarkable conditions. And I actually had the privilege of knowing that I was the very first person to hear it at all, except for them, and, and, uh, and so on. I also remember when Paul had the first acetate of Sgt. Pepper and brought it home, and we all listened to it just on a, a regular record player, you know, the gun with the speaker in the lid, you know, just a normal, not a big stereo or anything. Listen to it in the dining room at home for some reason being amazed by that, you know, realizing that this was a ridiculously important piece of art as well as a great pop record. And so I, I remember those things, and but all of those songs, I mean, it's impossible to choose between them in terms of favorites, I feel. <clears throat> well, someone has their hand raised. Can we call on Gorman Cook? Yes, here yeah. we are, Gorman. Hello, so how's that? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, hi, Gorman, how are you? Peter, I, I um, first of all, thank you for doing this. This is a, oh, it's a pleasure. It's exciting. The uh, author's series that Kathy mm -hmm. put on, a, a favorite of mine. Um, uh, so I have a, and I, I tuned in a little late, so you might have covered this. I apologize. But uh, I know nothing about producing records, but I get the sense that a band comes to you, they've got a set of songs, you listen to them, and then you change them a little bit. You maybe add orchestration, or and I'm curious, how does that dynamic work between the original artist and the producer in terms of how much input and change you can um, implement before you start to irritate the original artists? It, it varies case by case. It's a very good question. The answer is, um, it's never the same thing twice. Because in some cases, of course, it's not even that the band comes to you with a set of songs. I mean, that is sometimes the case. But for example, when making a Linda Ronstadt record, uh, step one was sitting down with Linda and finding and choosing the songs. Because, you know, when people don't write and, and Linda is the, you know, the finest interpreter of songs I've ever worked with in my life, that's the first question is, well, what songs are we gonna do? You know, and, and then the next question is, how are we gonna do them? And you talk through each song in terms of, what kind of arrangement, what kind of instrumentation, because it's not a band. You can, you know, if we decide to do it with a hundred bagpipe players or one acoustic guitar player, that's the decision we have to make and hire the people and tell them what to play and all of that. So, so it's, uh, it's all of the above. I've done band records, but not many. Um, I did a couple of albums with a band called 10,000 Maniacs, which, which were successful. Um, but most of the records I made have not actually been bands. So we, 
the first question is you know, choosing the instrumentation and choosing the players that you want to hire and so on. So with, with James Taylor or, or Linda or, you know, and I've done, as you know, records with Diana Ross and Cher. And, because the, the other thing that varies incredibly is the degree of artist participation. I mean, Linda, for example, likes to be there every second um, and has input, valuable input, significant input, uh, all the way through the process. In Cher's case, she prefers to have everything done, um, you know, and, and just come and sing on the finished track. And you hope to God she likes it. And, uh, you know, you, you, you may tell her your ideas up front, but in the end, possibilities always exist that you might have to go back to the drawing board. But but she comes in at the last minute and, and sings and, and does really well. She's done her homework, knows the song. But um, uh, in some cases, I've, you know, I've had the whole track entirely finished. I, I did a version with her, of, which was a hit called of It's In His Kiss, that the old Shoop Shoop song um, for the movie Mermaids. And, and that became a big hit. But that one in particular, I'd, I'd done everything. And she, I just needed her to come in and sing it. And she did very well. Um, I'm looking to see, um, Brian, do you see any hands raised? Oh yeah, uh, we do have a hand raised from uh, Lstat or Istat. Can we call on that person? Uh, yes, do you hear me? Yes, I do. Oh, you do, okay. Hi, again, thank you, Peter, for this. This is just terrific. What I'm curious about is George Martin. Yeah. You could talk a little bit about him, how he uh, got connected and, and uh, how he worked with the band. Of course. Um, how he got connected, I, I can speak to. Um, in the end, I'll answer the second half first because it's more confusing. I mean, I did not attend that many Beatles sessions. Most people didn't. I mean, if all the, Beatles who impl all the people who imply that they where at Beatles sessions were really there, it would have been incredibly crowded. But in fact, most of real work on records usually gets done most when, when it's just the musicians and the producer in the room. And that was the case. So um, in detail, can we, can we do, do we know exactly what the dynamic was between George and the Beatles? Not precisely. What we do know is he supplied obviously a lot of uh, so traditional musical knowledge, you know, technical musical knowledge that they didn't know. Um, so when George would suggest that maybe yesterday would sound good with the string quartet, you know, Paul wouldn't necessarily know what a string quartet was. You, 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 you cannot take it as an assumption that people, know. indeed, not everyone in the school probably knows what the actual lineup of a string quartet is. Um, uh, some do, some don't. And, you know, what, what pieces of string quartet music are are typical of the way a string quartet sounds. Um, of course, George was completely right. If you put a big orchestra on yesterday, it would have gone schmaltzy in, in the middle of the road and the string quartet was perfect. George made that suggestion. It's in value. Once Paul understood what a string quartet was, did he know exactly how to use it? Did he and George come up with that arrangement jointly? Yes, indeed they did. So when one doesn't want to overstate George's role in the sense that he didn't tell the Beatles what to do musically. Was he an absolutely invaluable advisor, consultant, and somebody who could supply knowledge they didn't have about what certain instruments can do, you know, how things fit together, what, what extra harmony notes might or might not be good. But it also doesn't mean that sometimes the Beatles would go, well, let's try this note, even if it's not theoretically correct, according to the rules of harmony. And sometimes they'd be right. So I think it's the fact that they listened to each other and that they had such a personal and affectionate bond that made it work. And, you know, as we all know now, if you ask people exactly what their recollections are, they'll all vary anyway. People don't remember exactly what happened in the studios 50 years ago, even when they think they do. Um, but what, what I do know is George was suggested by EMI, um, who signed the Beatles. And he was impressed by what he heard and wanted to produce them. The reason the Beatles were impressed by George had nothing to do with music. George Martin had produced comedy albums for Peter Sellers and for Spike Milligan, 
who were huge heroes to all of us. The biggest radio show in England at the time for all of us was the thing called The Goon Show, which was a weekly radio show with Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan. You may not even know who Spike Milligan is, but he's the father of British comedy and a genius and worth looking up. Um, he and Peter Sellers and the guy called, another actor, Harry Seacombe, had this weekly show with which we were all obsessed. Everyone does goon show voices and so on, including Prince Charles. Who I've, the only conversation I ever had with him was about the goon show. And, and uh, so when they realized he had produced this Peter Sellers album called Songs for Sweeney Sellers, that is brilliant and incorporates lots of sound effects and, and bits of music and stuff that later showed up in Beatles records. So that's what they admired so much about George Martin. And he was brilliant at that. And I think that's more than his musical credentials. That, that was what sold the Beatles and made them excited about the idea of working with them. And then they found, of course, what an expert and remarkable musician he was. One of the most extraordinary coincidences in a bit of George Martin trivia is that before um, any of us met in a Beatles context, he was, uh, 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 as well as being a pianist and an arranger, he was an oboe player. And he, he studied at the Guildhall School of Music, but he took some independent oboe lessons when he wanted to improve his oboe playing long before any of us met him in, a, in another context. And he took those, less, those lessons from my mother, uh, which is really odd. So by the time she met him again, she met him as a daughter's record, uh, uh, a daughter's boyfriend's record producer, um, she already knew him. She, she was uh, Miss Elliot who had taught him the oboe, uh, a brush up on his playing. And somewhere there's, an, there's actually an interview. They did a documentary on George Martin and they interviewed him and my mother together with her talking about his oboe lessons and stuff. It's quite entertaining. Great, I think we have time for at least one more. I see um, Rob Whalen with his hand up. Can we call on Rob? Yeah, this is, uh, this is super enjoyable and thank you for this time. I'm getting, a, I have a huge smile on my face this whole time, even if I haven't been showing it to you. So I have a, I have a two part question real quick. Sure. Uh, one of my college roommates uh, is a producer and I, I know that there's been this, it's just like any relationship between an artist and a producer. There's a lot of unrequited love that happens. You maybe have wanted to produce an album for somebody or somebody has wanted you to produce their album, but the, the relationship never coalesced. Would you be willing to share with us some people that you've wished or dreamed or hoped to, uh, to be able to produce an album for them <clears throat> that has not worked out? That was question number one. Question number two is your guitar in the video is begging all of us to ask you to pick up that guitar before you leave and play us something. Thanks for your time, appreciate it. Well Thank you. Um, okay, the, the, um, uh, sorry, what was the first stuff again? I, was, I got I sidetracked by the guitar. What was the first one about? Um, first question was about unrequited Oh, producing other people, right. Yeah. Um, yep. uh, not, I can't think of anybody immediately in the past. I mean, there's always produced people that I'd love to produce um, because I'm so many people I'm a big fan of, you know. Uh, um, but it doesn't mean to say that they, that they need me. Very often they're already making brilliant records with somebody else. I mean, for example, I'm oddly enough, two of my favorite singers now are both Brandy. I'm a big fan of Brandy Clark and Brandy Carlisle and, and would love to produce either or both of them and, and have, have made noises in, in that direction. But in both cases, they're already making terrific records, you know, um, and that's so often the case. I mean, of course, I'd be lying if I didn't, that I'd love to produce Billie Eilish. I think she's the finest singer around by a million miles. But, you know, it's not as if her brother's doing a, doing a second rate job. He's complete genius and her records are fabulous. So, um, you know, you see what I mean? It's like, yeah, I'd love to produce all kinds of people, but usually they're doing it just, just very nicely, thank you, without me. So, in some cases, you know, I became a big Ed Sheeran fan the very first time I ever heard him about 10 years ago in London, I guess, nine years ago when he first started. And I did make a point of getting to meet him and tell him, you know, I think I know a good singer-songwriter when I hear one and you're it. And we have become friends and I did actually produce a track with him for an Elton John uh, tribute album. We did a version of Candle and the Wind together, which was fun. So sometimes my wishes do come true. But, but 
uh, one, one never knows, you know. Now to the guitar. Um, yeah, that's what's bouncing. That, um, it would be confusing now because it's, uh, it's in a complicated drop D tuning. It's not much you can really play, but it's a good sound because I'm, who knows if you can hear it over the thing or not. But, yeah, this is my 12 string Gibson that they made in some years ago. Beautiful. Um, All right, I think um, in lieu of that, let's, let's, uh, I think we have time for, um, before we uh, um, thank you for the final time and let you go, let's take, um, David Hilvers has a question I see, can we log, uh, can we, can we uh, fire up his screen? That's Hello. Right, Dave. I see David and David. Oh. Hello, I'm yes. sorry, I don't have my video on i'm not sure how to do that but um can you oh, hear me crasher yes. yes i hear you thanks it's, it's, uh, first of all it's an honor to uh, listen and see you mr asher and curtis thank you for the wonderful uh day here the question i have maybe a two-part uh i recall the day that i was watching the ed sullivan show and the beatles came on there yes and where were you at that time in their career in that era uh that's interesting the ed sullivan show is an interesting uh case in point actually uh well when the beatles were on ed sullivan i guess we were not even yet signed when, when was that you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm terrible sorry, at i can't remember stuff. it had to be yeah. in the 60s oh yeah it was definitely the 60s but um yeah uh i think when they were on ed sullivan we were probably either just being signed or not yet signed. Um, because, you know, they were in America, I think about six months before we came. And, you know, what's interesting is when they got the phone call about being number one, when I want old Jam went to number one, or when we got the phone call about what would I love being number one, the um, most significant aspect of that for all of us was that it meant we would get to go to America. I mean, the number oneness was exciting, but the real thrill was they can't stop us now. We, we will get to go to America. We'd all idolized America and American music um, forever. You know, we, we American music was miraculous to us. The whole British invasion was based around us falling in love with your music, tweaking it ever so slightly and selling it all back to you. It's kind of extraordinary when you think about it. And and because we thought you didn't know, you know, what, what you had. Um, in fact, you know, again, I'm digressing, but I'll give you an example. You know, we all were big Little Richard fans and, uh, and loved Little Richard and, and bought all his records. And Tutti Fruity became a big hit in England. You know, Little Richard wrote it, he sang it brilliantly, it was a great record, we all loved it. And we could look at the American charts because they were in the Melody Maker magazine each week. And we couldn't believe our eyes when we looked in the US charts and Little Richard was not there at all. But number one was Pat Boone's cover version of Tutti Frutti. And we kind of went, you know what? They don't, they don't get it. <laughs> they don't know what they've got, you know? And, and uh, of course now we, we should look back on that moment and, and realize that it could have, we could have served as advance warning that as much as we all love America dearly and I'm proud to be an American, it is a country occasionally capable of making most god awful choices. But there you go. All right, let's squeeze in. Congratulations, let's squeeze in, um, Mr. Asher, and best to you. Let's squeeze Thank you very much. One, let's squeeze in one from David Torres, and I want to be mindful. I know we have a hard stop of 1 p.m. Pacific time. Um, so can we call on David yeah, Torres? Sure, sure. Thanks. Uh, great uh, speaking with you and, and listening to uh, about your book here. It's, it's fascinating. I uh, just, on a Two part, just real, real quick. Uh, Do you ever work with uh, John Lennon and during his solo career and uh, over have any experience working over at the record plant on Thirty Eighth Street in New York? It's what my old office building. Uh, that's that's kind of a no and a yes. I I never worked with John. I, in fact, I didn't really see much of John after you know Apple and the Beatles all all ended and the Beatles broke up. We ran into each other in passing once or twice, but. Um, uh, I did not remain in touch with them much and I didn't ever get to work with them. I did, I was at the record plant in New York and I can't remember why, what I was doing there, but I've definitely worked there for a day hey, or two. 
Yeah, yeah fam famous place is my one of my old office buildings. But uh, my my real question here is is uh, really about today's more around today's music. You know, several famous uh, musicians always trace a lot of their influence back to the Beatles. And I'm I'm just curious with with respect to your knowledge. You know, your, even your book A to Z uh, of the Beatles. You know, songs. Do you, is it easy for someone like you to just identify that influence in songs that you hear? You know, today's more modern songs today, pop or whatever. Do, do, you, do you naturally feel um, that or see that? I, it's an interesting question. Sometimes one sees a specific Beatles influence, but no, quite often one doesn't. But it's always interesting to discover, you know, how many, of course, musicians from other fields are gigantic Beatles fans, you know, like a knowledgeable and performer, like Pharrell, for example, is a huge right. Beatles fan. Um, I know Dave Grohl is, I'm trying to think who else, but the, they, sometimes you run into people in, in totally other fields, you know, in the hip hop field or folk field or whatever, but they end up going, well, and of course, I love the Beatles and know every song you ever did. So, sure. uh, and sometimes there's great cover versions in other, like Sarah Jarosz does a brilliant version of Drive My Car, which is, which is I, I love, and I think she's brilliant. She's another person I'm a huge fan of and would love to reduce, by the way. Awesome. I'm just as ambitious as I was, as you can tell. <laughs> Thank so, you. So, the book. The book is The Beatles from A to Z, an alphabetical mystery tour. And we can't thank Peter Asher enough. We are going to send out a link from Kathy Hurley to all the people who viewed this on how they can um, find, your, find your book. We can also find you on the Beatles channel with your great um, uh, radio program that we'll be uh, watching out for. So we, we wanna bring you back on the screen one more time so uh, you can say goodbye to us, but we say thank you for your time today, Peter Asher. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure. No, it, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it. I wish we could figure out a way for me to sign books for people. I'm just, maybe we can. Right. We'll, well, we'll, so I'd rather have, that, have this. I have um, Stephanie um, from the bookstall. The owner of the bookstall is on this uh, Zoom and she, her and I were just talking about that. So Stephanie, can you unmute and um, answer Peter's question about how we can get signed books? Hi, oh sure, yeah. Um, if you have book plates, Peter, we're happy to insert them into books, or if you don't have them, we can send them along with an envelope. So uh, yes, yeah, send, send me some book plates and I'll do, I'm happy to do personalized ones if people let you know or, or anything. Perfect. Okay. And we can do personalized as well. So Kathy, we'll look to you to get the contact information. In. Great. Okay. Right. Wonderful. So everybody that's on here, we want to sell Peter's book and please buy from the bookstall and not from Amazon. They're making enough money off of us already. I agree. I love bookshops. I, I like, we need to keep bookshops alive at all costs. Yeah. And we love the bookstall, Maneka. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It has. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye now. I noticed there's three people in the chat. I wonder what happened to them. All right, let's see about that.